so you've got some of this stuff to go on. Okay, so then when it comes to the basic joints, fibrous, they don't really move, aka the sutures of your skull. Cartilage, allow a little bit, aka we're talking about our uh, intervertebral discs. You could also say maybe, eh, you could maybe say like the SI joint. Okay. And is what we normally think of with the joint. So and they don't want too much movement. Yeah, no shit. Too much movement equals usually you gotta go uh, gotta go meet some medical professionals. So go to your dad. Yeah, no kidding. So joints straight up, it's gonna be obviously how many axes that are moving. So or how many axes it rotates about. So okay. elbows uniaxial. Uh, whereas the knee isn't, the knee is actually considered, it's technically a bi-axial joint because you've got knee extension and flexion, but since you're sitting there, turn your, like grab the back of your knee and then turn your foot to the left, turn your foot to the right, and you can feel how that's going on at your tibia. Right, yeah. So just be careful because they might try to get tricky. Okay. Multi-axial shoulder. So, yeah, so I mean, just kind of um, can you go back to the previous slide? So, just just somewhat. Oh, hi, Ben. Let me put this on for you. Where did I put that remote? Yeah. I All right, trying to entertain the, the boy for an hour before. Um, so just like, just to make sure I'm understanding right, like for example, um, um, let's see, so shoulder, hip, um, you know, would your, would your ankle be considered multi-axial? No, so trying to consider the ankle to be a biaxial. Right, so I'm reading that. So I guess my, my question is why is that, why is that, well, I guess because your shoulder you can, yeah, okay, I guess that makes sense because you don't really rotate your, your ankle in the same well, way. Well, the key is, you think about it, you get flexion, you get plantar flexion, dorsiflexion, yeah. and, and, you know, pronation and eversion. Right. But the key is what you get at the rotator cuff that you don't get is you get internal and external rotation. You can't just twist your ankle. Well, you can't twist your ankle, but yeah, it's supposed to. Yeah, it's meant to move. Right. Okay. Um, so then, you know, things like, you know, I, well, I guess metatarsals, not metatarsals, but phalanges and all that. Are those you uh, uniaxial. No, think about it, because your fingers, they're at least biaxial. Yeah, okay. Okay. So, the vertebral spine, they might try to get um, cute with it, but just but you know the different regions so cervical being your neck thoracic meaning your rib cage lumbar sacrum coccyx um and the one thing to keep in mind is the lumbar and the sacrum are the same number the key is the sacrum is all fused together right so it's considered to be made up of five different bones but you know all the bones effectively work as one piece Yeah, we, we've had actually, as we've kind of had some increases in uh, uh, in ability, we've had some relatively um, relatively decent increase in SI joint issues as our volumes increased a little bit with some having kind of an older team. I got a lot of kids on the highest volumes we've had, and their SI mm -hmm. is not not 
that's probably one of our more common things we're dealing with these days. Hmm. You know, I wonder, I don't know if you've ever done it, if there's maybe just like a slight bilateral asymmetry in the lower body. And so when you put that much, uh, meaning like actual like limb length, that when you put them on that high volume, then they start to show with it. But otherwise, it's such a small amount of damage, it never matters until they get to, you know, crazy volumes. Yeah, and it's much more common in females for us. Hmm. Interesting. So, yeah. Each muscle is an organ that contains all of those things. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, epimysium, the outside, paramysium, which is going to be around each fascicle, and then the endomysium wrapped around each individual. Yeah, so, okay. Um, yeah, perfect. So, the... We have, a, we have a doctor here in town who likes to sound a lot smarter than he is. I know he's a doctor, so I, I can't be an idiot, but he was, I guess, was two years ago, whatever, he was trying to tell one of our kids, like, they had a, a perimysium tear, blah, 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 and all this stuff. We're just like, okay, this sounds relatively severe, and he just kept on going on and on, and then the guy's just kind of a, he's got little man syndrome. He's like 5'4". He's kind of a douche. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, well, the food's downstairs, man. Just go get some cereal. He's not being real kind to the wife. Mm. Um, but I, I guess my, the last time I heard that uh, perimysium was when Dr. Bowen was being a huge doucher. Yeah. I mean, that is a possibility, but it seems highly unlikely. And yeah, well, and yeah, he's just, yeah, not, we don't use him as a doctor anymore. He's on my band list, yeah. which is funny, but I, yeah. Hey, you know, like anything else, there's a bell curve in every profession. There's going to be people that are really good at it, people really bad. And unfortunately, medicine, it's really hard to figure out where they're at. And the other side of it being, I'm, I'm just going to hypothetically say the best doctors probably didn't want to end up in Cape Girardeau. Well, you know, what's funny is that 15, 20 years ago, true. <laughs> More recently, you know, we're one of our hospitals in the process of being bought out by uh, Wash U Orthopedic and mm. Barnes. And so mm -hmm. we've got a huge influx of much higher quality doctors. Uh, but your specialist where you struggle, your your asthmologist or your uh, endocrinologist, that stuff's a little bit tougher. Um, mm -hmm. But your your orthopedics and general uh, physicians have increased in quality exponentially the last five to ten years. Nice. So yeah. All right. So and I hope you can so the motor unit thing, this is one that can get people off a little bit in that, okay. in that one motor neuron innervates a number of fibers. So that's the big key. And that's also a difference between slow twitch and fast twitch fibers. Slow twitch fibers do are innervated. Like we'll say there's 10 to a hundred of them innervated by one motor neuron for fast twitch fibers. It's more like a thousand individual fibers can be innervated by one motor neuron. Okay. So it's that one neuron, the axon coming all the way down until we get to the neuromuscular junction. And then that's where that neuron is going to be releasing the neurotransmitter acetylcholine, which is going to allow for that muscle contraction. Okay. And so, like, if this was true to scale, and let's say this is a slow twitch, you would see all of these axons coming down and going to a lot more individual fibers. 
So right now, I mean, it's meant to, this is meant to be like an intact muscle and a number of fibers on it. But so these would be its own individual fiber that it's going down to. And then so a fast switch fiber would have a whole lot more. So individual muscle fiber. You've got your sarcolemma. Sarcolemma is the same thing as the cell membrane. Okay. Is it has differing functions due to the specificity of muscle than a normal cell membrane. You then have what's known as T-tubules. And T-tubules are a network of little holes that effectively run all the way through your muscle cells. And that's what allows action potentials to travel through the cells way faster than they would otherwise. Now, instead of your normal endoplastic reticulum, muscle cells have what's known as a sarcoplasmic reticulum. And this is gonna be butted up right up against those T-tubules. And this is where calcium is stored by a protein known as calcequestrin that whenever the action potential reaches from the T-tubules to the sarcoplastic reticulum, it's going to cause it to be released into the sarcoplasm, which is the same thing as the cytoplasm, but the specific way it's named for muscle. And then that's going to allow for your action potential to convert into a true muscle contraction. Okay. So now that's kind of the macro. When we get all the way down to the individual contractile units, that's what's known as a sarcomere. And so the sarcomere are made up of thick filaments, which is going to be this myosin right here, and the thin filaments, which is actin. And so you can see through here how, now this is the banding bullshit. It might show up. If it does, you know it is. M-line is where all the myosin proteins are linked together. The I-band is where it's just actin. And then the A-band is where actin and myosin are overlapping. It's something that I personally think is a really stupid thing to focus on, but for some reason it shows up on occasion. Okay, so yeah, one more time on that because the text is kind of small on this one. Yeah, that's why I'm um, trying to get this bad boy sized up a little bit for you. Oh, that's a lot better. Yeah, so this is a whole lot of individual sarcomeres. So like okay. the individual like myosin right there and then the thin little ropes that it pulls onto is known as actin. So the myosin literally grabs the actin and pulls it into the midline. And it does so by literally ratcheting these individual little heads that will grab, pull it forward, and then re-grab and pull it forward until it hits this uh, point where all the myosin are effectively interwoven together. So the M line is the line of where it's just myosin and myosin interacting. The I band is where it's just actin. The A band is where myosin and actin are overlapping. And then the Z line is the end where it's just, it's where actin then faces in both directions. Okay. And the Z line is actually where you get most of your structural damage from doing eccentric training. And then that's what's going to signal to rebuild muscle. Well, one of the things that helps signal to rebuild muscle. Okay, now, okay. looking at actin, do you see that thin red line over it? Yes. That's tropomyosin. That's what is blocking the sites that myosin can grab hold of on actin to cause a muscular contraction. Now, troponin is the protein that when calcium binds to it, it moves tropomyosin off of those active sites so myosin can grab hold and bind. So calcium is what allows a contraction to occur. It binds to the troponin, troponin moves tropomyosin, and now myosin can grab onto actin. Now, the issue with this is Muscular contraction, just having your muscle hold on in a static position, doesn't require ATP. It only requires calcium. So hence, why you can be cramping up after a hard workout, because you still are sending an action potential, and you need ATP to actually literally get myosin to let go of actin and doing what's known as cross-bridging.
Vale. I have not taken handwritten notes in so long. My hand's already tired. Hey, that's why I'm recording this also for you so you can re-listen to it later on. I'll throw it up on uh, I'll throw it up on YouTube and make sure it's unlisted. Gotcha. Because, you know, you may or may not have said things about uh, certain healthcare workers in your town. Fuck Bowen, put it up there. That's my cousin. <laughs> so, action potential, which is the nervous impulse coming down from the motor neuron, goes all the way down till it hits the neuromuscular junction. Once it's there, it releases a, ves a vesicle, which is just like a little storage packet of acetylcholine. The acetylcholine goes across the neuromuscular junction, binds to what is known as the ligand-gated receptor. If enough of them bind there, it's going to then open the voltage-gated channels, which is going to allow even more sodium to rush into the muscle cell, which causes, and it's, that's an action potential. That action potential is going to keep causing that sodium influx until it gets to the T-tubules. It's going to go into the cell and then go and cause that signal to go from the T-tubule into the sarcoplastic reticulum. Once it gets in the sarcoplastic reticulum, calcium is going to be released from what's known as calcisequestrin. This calcium is then going to go ahead and head into the sarcoplasm, where it's going to bind to troponin. Troponin is going to move tropomyosin, and now myosin is going to start cross bridging. It's a lot, but effectively, it's a Rube Goldberg machine. You know, A causes B, causes C, causes D, and until eventually you have contraction. Is that something that, that I should make sure I'm pretty well versed on, you think, testing wise? Is that something you think is going to be relatively. Uh... Um, comment on the test. The thing is, if you if you fully understand that, and you understand yeah. all the different, um, essentially pieces of architecture of a muscle cell and the nerve cell, you, you're doing pretty good. Like you really understand like one of the bigger parts of muscle physiology when it comes to okay. exercise. So I would, yeah. I go through that clip maybe a couple times. Yeah. So, actin's on either end. Myosin pulls it in together. There's your sliding film in theory. Woo! But obviously, it's a little bit more involved. Oh God! Now, what we're looking at here is muscle when it's in a stretch position, in a normal position, and then when it's in a fully contracted. So notice when you're in a stretch position, there's not as much myosin that can cross bridge over an actin. That's literally why you're weaker in a long range of motion than you are in a shorter range of motion. Now that's from active muscle contraction. You do have contributions of the muscle fascia and the tendon, which are gonna give you some of the elastic component of strength, which you know, like anytime you've tried to stretch yourself or stretch out a tight kid, you can feel that tension the hamstring is giving you. And so then in the mid range, notice that's where you're the strongest. And that's because you've got all of those myosin heads can now grab hold of actin. So they're all going to be able to help produce active force. But then once we get to the shortened position, we're literally butting up actin and myosin up, you know, head to head, they can't go any further. So like that's as tight of a contraction you can make. And so you're not gonna produce as much force in that position. The other thing to keep in mind is this is just looking at one individual sarcomere. These sarcomeres are running in series all the way through the length of your muscle. So there's thousands upon thousands of these that are all going through that same, at about the same rate where they're gonna be all shortened or all lengthened doesn't really seem to happen too much where like one part is tight, excuse me, one part is contracted, one part is relaxed in normal muscle function. You can get around that when you stab people and things like that. <laughs> okay. Well, it's um, metal is obviously electroconductive tissue. So like whenever I got muscle biopsies done on my thighs, you know, when I was in Kansas, it'll cause just that little part of the muscle to contract. Because I'm not sending a nerve impulse to tell my entire quad to contract. Instead, the metal inside of the muscle is going to cause bits and pieces of that muscle in around that needle specifically to depolarize. 
So it feels real weird. So now this is something to make sure you understand is our different phases. So resting is just when it's not contracting. Excitation, contraction, coupling phase, that's when we're sending that action potential, acetylcholine, going on through, causing the action potential in the muscle. Now, contraction phase, obviously going to be when we're actually pulling through. Recharge phase, so to speak. Think of that as the point at which where the muscle is now starting to relax. So it's no longer the calcium starting to get pumped back until finally we're in full relaxation phase. And that's where it's going to go ahead and be able to completely regenerate ATP, completely regenerate um, or we'll remove calcium, uh, not completely, but get it far, far to lower levels. And our cat is telling Norbs he's not cool with his existence this morning. So the more cross bridges you have, the greater force you're going to produce in a muscle. And so the more cross bridges we're going to be able to make is going to occur because we're literally sending a greater nervous impulse through much more as a number motor fibers to get all those to contract and produce that force. And we need both calcium and ATP in order to get muscles to contract and to relax. So you need calcium to go in to cause contraction, but to leave to get relaxation and you need ATP to get myosin to release from actin and then grab hold again ratchet forward release grab ratchet forward release grab ratchet forward so the atp is actually what causes it to release so hence once again why you can have an energy insufficiency cramp which i'm sure you've had happen probably happened to you a couple times when you're getting back used to swinging a hammer a lot and your hand would cramp up on you and just not let go you know what's funny is probably uh Probably the worst cramp I've gotten actually was when I was a swimmer. Hmm. Worst ones for me, honestly, was, is always been rock climbing. Oh, okay. After like a long day of trying to, I don't know, long day, but you know, doing a lot of rock climbing, my hands will just complete up, like ball up. But hey. What I'm surprised with is how many kids I've met that they're like, no, I've never had that happen. I'm like, you either did nothing but sensible programming or you never really got after it that hard. Yeah, I think that's, yeah. Or, or uh, my, my experience with swimming is got after real hard when you're in severely uh, terrible swim shape. That was my. Yeah. yeah. Well, there's some very real research on how if you're, You've got the neurological drive to do it. We don't have the physiology. Specifically, your physiology isn't ready for it. You know, that's why old dudes can pop their Achilles playing pick up uh, softball and stuff like that. Because they still know how to run. Mm -hmm. The tissues haven't had to run. That makes perfect sense, yeah. You know, it's like getting in an old beat up pickup truck and trying to, you know, drive it like you did when it first came off a lot. It just doesn't work like that anymore. Okay, so big one here. The action potential releases that acetylcholine. It's not a done deal that you're gonna have a muscle contraction because you release the acetylcholine. You have to release enough acetylcholine. So until you go from what's known as a graded potential to finally an action potential. Action potential is like shit's happening, it's all or none, there's no going back from here. But if you go ahead and you don't send enough acetylcholine, your muscle's not gonna contract. So there's one potential place that you can have a failure to get the muscles to contract. Now, how much control we're gonna have is gonna come down to how many individual motor units we're going to be activating at a greater or at a certain period of time. So the more individual motor units we've got going to a muscle, the more refined control we're gonna have of how much force we're gonna produce. So that's why you see a greater amount of individual neurons going to like the muscles of the forearm than you do seeing it going to things like the quads. 
where it's like, I mean, yeah, you can produce, you've got a lot of motor neurons, but for like the amount of muscle mass, it's going to be a way higher number in the hands because of the dexterity required than what's going to the thigh. So, all or none literally means that individual motor units, so that one neuron going to those however many individual fibers, they only have two options, which is contract or relax. That's it. Now you can contract and send enough contraction that you get the greatest force production from that fiber, or you can contract a little bit that you just get a little twitch. But either way, each individual fiber, that's the only options it has. You can't try to tell the fiber that we only want you to half contract. Like that doesn't happen. It's either a twitch or a number of twitches put close together or just a full contraction. There's no like, I want to use 50% of this individual fiber. What we can instead do is use 50% of that total muscle, like as an in innervating just that number of fibers. And that's why, you know, you don't knock yourself out with your coffee cup in the morning because you contract your bicep fully whenever you try to bring the mug to your face. So, uh, so kind of like I said, twitch, summation of twitching, and then tetanus, and really just, that's just the full contraction of the fiber. And that's how this is gonna look. So you've got a twitch, you send a second twitch, so you get a little bit more force, it's gonna relax. Then you're gonna have what's known as unfused tetanus, so we're sending enough contractions up on top of each other, we're pretty close, and then we're gonna have just a full-blown fused tetanus, I mean, that's hooking up to a car battery, so you got nowhere to hide but to fully contract that fiber. Can you go back to the previous slide so I can kind of put the, yeah. the okay, single twitch force resulting from a summation of two twitches. Okay. So is, is B on the, on the figure, is that really A and B combined? Or is B its own individual thing? Like is B the first twitch A, the second twitch B? Yeah, so oh here, let me, let's do this. I did some modifications to the other slides and I haven't done that to these yet. So give me a moment. Okay, so see that single twitch. So when you just send a little, like just enough that we get an action potential, you don't get a full contraction from that individual fiber. Then whenever you go and you send two twitches, that's where you're gonna see, you know, that's the first twitch and then the second twitch, so you get a little bit more force. Unfused tetanus is where you're sending enough contractions that you're getting effectively. That's why you see it goes down, but then the next contraction would come, go down, next contraction, next contraction and hold you there. And then finally, fused tetanus is just maximal force production from that fiber. So give me an example of unfused tetanus. Um, hmm. Unfused tetanus would be like if you take somebody that doesn't really know what they're doing in the weight room and you have them push as hard as they can against an object. Okay. They're going to be able to produce a decent amount of force, but you're going to see them shaking and rattling because they're not used to using their fiber right. for that. Um, it's kind of like watching your guys like bench press for the first time. Yeah. Yeah. And then fused tetanus is whenever you put like, you know, a, a strength athlete or someone else that knows what they're doing in a weight room and have them just, I want you to produce as much force as you can. And that'll be how much that they're literally able yeah, to. Maybe, maybe more like, see, I, yeah, I, I guess in my mind, like I see that is the unforced is usually when you put, um, uh, put a weight over you, you know, maybe a squat or a bench where um, you have no choice but to try and get it up. Whereas a fuse, maybe like a deadlift, where you're putting all the force you can, even if you don't get it up, you you know, because it's too heavy, you're still you're still able to put you know maximal force in continuously because you're trying to lift it. Yeah, that 
I, I see your point. Um, the only reason I say the difference between using like something that's isometric is because when you start moving things dynamically, then you're getting the muscle, you're getting the play of muscle spindle function and Golgi tendon organ function. Muscle okay. spindling, you know what those are, right? Do you know what a muscle spindle and a Golgi tendon organ is? I do not. Okay. Muscle spindle is the one that you guys are really trying to train up specifically with like your high jumpers. And that is literally a, a sensory component inside of skeletal muscle that it detects stretch on the muscle. And when it detects stretch on the muscle, it tells the muscle to contract. Okay. So you're, you're literally trying to get that to be more sensitive from training with a lot of athletes. The Golgi tendon organ is the, the stretch receptor in the tendon. And when it detects stretch on the tendon, it literally inhibits the muscle from contracting as a means to help keep the muscle from tearing the tendon off the bone. So like, I'm a great example of my Golgi tendon organ not doing its job. But hard training desensitizes your Golgi tendon organs and sensitizes your muscle spindle. So it's kind of an effect of really long periods of training. Um, if you want a good example of like GTOs firing, that would be like if you see a bro at the wreck, like, yeah, man, I'm gonna hit a new PR and they're lowering the bar, and then all of a sudden it just looks like they, they gave out, like they're not pushing at all. That's because their GTOs fired because they were trying to bring mm -hmm. their tendons and literally shut them down. Gotcha. Yeah. So different fiber types, slow twitch, fast twitch, even faster, fast twitch. You don't find these a lot in most humans, specifically if they're even uh, ones that are highly trained. Yeah, there's your sane bolts, but the, those are mutants. Your average human, especially if they train really hard, positioning in hybrid fibers from 2X to 2A or from 2X to 1, depending on properties of those individual muscle fibers. So, just remember, slow twitch is really good at anything that is more aerobic. Fast twitch is obviously better at anything that requires high speed. And everything that you would think would be related to it like that is going to follow just like that. Okay. Sorry, my four-year-old was yelling at me that we're talking too loud. <laughs> <laughs> what are you into? Right. 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 Mm -hmm. What are neurons? Okay. I feel like this slide probably got a lot of stuff that they're going to ask questions on. Honestly, just remember the guiding principle, which is whatever would make it a better, it, it, they can't be better at both. They're either going to be better at aerobic performance or they're going to be better at high speed, high power performance. So whatever's related to those two, right. you're going to see things being better for that. I'm sorry, Mark. Pause, pause for a second. Then I am in a meeting right now, buddy. What do you need? Um, yeah. I'll turn this up a little bit, buddy, but it's got to be loud so I can hear. Otherwise, I won't pass my test and we'll lose our weight room. All right. Sorry, Mike. No, you're good, man. We're back. So just remember, whatever would make these fibers better at let's whatever component is involved that would make it better at aerobic performance, it's going to be in a type one fiber. Whatever is okay. going to get better at power or speed performance is going to be in the fast twitch fibers. And then so the opposite is true. So, I mean, we'll just go with your world, which is slow twitch fibers. Motor neuron is small and recruitment threshold is low. The reasoning for that, actually that's probably the one thing I should cover, which is 
we already talked about how you don't get a lot of individual fibers being contracted through slow twitch because literally they're the most metabolically efficient ones because they're typically aerobic. So if you have to pick fibers to do something with, you typically want to start off with using the ones that are the most efficient, AKA your type one. So hence the recruitment threshold is low. The first fibers you're ever tapping into for any movement is going to be slow twitch. Then you're going to tap into those fast twitch fibers when you really need to get something done. And you'll tap into the fast and the fast switch when you're really trying to just obliterate something. So, you know, you getting up from the couch and walking you know, downstairs, that's going to be pretty much all done with slow twitch fibers. But if all of a sudden Finn sh shouts fire, you're going to jump up out of that seat real fast and sprint downstairs. And that's where you're going to be tapping in your type two fibers. Because it's about the body. Think of, uh, when you think of the human body, think of, um, Give me one second. It does, yes. Now, so hence the conduction velocity, contraction speed, relaxation speed, all those are slow for slow twitch, okay? They're fast for the fast twitch, as you think. Fatigue resistance and endurance, really good for slow twitch fibers, not so much for fast twitch. Your force output and power output, it is lower in that individual neurons to your fast switch fibers contract a greater amount of fiber area but when you actually control for fiber area there's literally no difference in force production size per size between fast and slow switch fibers the big difference is the power output okay and so then your type 1 fibers have got a lot of aerobic enzymes your type 2 fibers have a lot of anaerobic enzymes Sarcoplasmic reticulum complexity is relatively low because turns out you're not having to send that much signal that quickly to get it to contract and relax. Capillary density and myoglobin, which is the storage form, uh, it's the, he the heme element that carries oxygen from the sarcoplasm to the mitochondria. So it takes it from hemoglobin in the blood. That's gonna be pretty high in your type, in your slow fibers. You've got more mitochondria and they're bigger in your slow twitch, and the fibers in general are smaller for your small twitch. And the color is just fucking nonsense, who cares? <laughs> well, I just remember so, it's red. Yeah. yeah. So as I'm, I'm looking, a lot of this is, I guess, pretty integral to, to my job. And so fortunately, I'm pretty familiar with a decent amount of this, but some of the more, um, some of the verbiage, I guess, is what I'm not familiar with. The concepts, yeah, yes, but the verbiage is what's going to throw me a loop because I'm not going to know exactly what they're asking. Exactly. So like, I've sent you, I've, I've given you these slides before, right? Yeah. So you, you sent me these along with, was there a practice test on there, maybe? Yeah, I think I sent you some practice questions. Um, yeah. Your homework, because I mean, literally, this is just chapter one, is mm -hmm. I would look at the chapters and yeah. you can go chapter by chapter and figure out, like, what do you look at? And you're like, what the hell does this even mean? For those, go ahead and, uh, like, literally just cut the slides down to what you don't fully understand. And you and I can keep going through it. Okay. To save you even more time. Now, a big thing to keep in mind. Okay. Actually, let's go to the key point. Motor units are composed of muscle fibers with specific morphological and physiological characteristics that determine their functional capacity. What that really says is motor units all are a little bit different. And so we all have a certain amount of hybrid fibers, meaning we're not just this much is slow twitch, this much is fast twitch A, and this much is fast twitch X. Instead, it's we have a certain amount that's just pure type 1. Then we have a certain amount that's type 1 slash 2A. Then we've got a certain amount that's pure 2A. And then we got a certain amount that's 2A slash 2X and then even a, an incredibly small fraction that's type one slash 2A slash 2X. And then the very, very lucky mutants of us 
that are true like Usain Bolt level sprinters have pure 2x fiber, but that's pretty damn rare in most humans that are well trained. Now, how you innervate that muscle is literally going to change the expression of those individual fiber types inside of that muscle. So, you know, you and I, for example, if, you know, obviously we've got in theory about 12.5% of our genetics in common. And seeing as how we resemble each other, I'd argue that it's a little bit higher in certain regards. So you and I probably have pretty similar muscle fiber types, but thanks to how I've trained compared to how you've trained, if we're to biopsy our legs, your leg, I would expect to have a much higher amount of type one fibers than I have. And I would expect mine to have a higher amount of type two A fibers because of all the training I've done. But I'm, I'm not trying to throw shade, but we'll say if uh, I had a brother that was sedentary and then we did a muscle biopsy of him, he would have the highest amount of 2X out of both of us because muscle tries to actually favor power output over endurance. And that's more because of like self-preservation. But once you start training, those hybrid fibers are going to start to show more of the elements of whatever your training stimulus is. So yeah, your your Usain Bolts, your Med, your freaks of the freaks, those folks were literally born just like insanely just type one or insanely type two A or type two X. But most of us are, are pretty much a, about a 50-50 split between slow and fast. It's then how you train that you're gonna have a slightly greater expression of that with time, which in turn is gonna slightly increase your performance. Because it's the it's the two A that's got the the ability to kind of swap between with training potential so type one can start to take on properties of type 2a okay 2a can start to take on properties of type one like i've got a friend at uh kennesaw state that he's doing research with crossfitters and and high level crossfitters at that and i'm really interested to see if they ever can start doing some because he's tried to do some biopsy stuff and I think the samples they got, it wasn't good enough to really run and look at the stuff they wanted to, but I'd be really interested to see what the fiber types and like the development of the mitochondrial density in the type 2A fibers and stuff like that in a CrossFitter, high level CrossFitter, compared to a long distance runner, compared to, you know, an Olympic lifter. It's obviously, you know, they're not going to beat a true marathoner at a marathon and they're not going to beat a, you know, high level weightlifter, weightlifter, but, you know, they're going to give, people a run for their money that, you know, otherwise think they're decent at something because they're just that well developed. So yeah, I'm intrigued, but I haven't, I haven't seen any science out there on that yet. So okay. we can vary our force production by how many uh, motor units we're recruiting. Um, the way I try to tell this to my students is if all of us were out on a field and we had like a football field and we had a sled that literally spanned the entire length of the field and it was completely empty. Now, one of us could be literally walking, pulling that sled across and we're not needed. But as we put more and more weight on the sled, more and more of us are going to have to start pulling the sled. So eventually it's going to move. And that's how we're going to go from just having one fiber to more and more fibers. And so, yeah, we can vary it by literally the frequency of activating those and then the number of activated motor units. So an example of that would be if you have like a really light weight of you can just turn everything on at the very beginning of the movement and the momentum of the, sorry, the inertia you're going to develop is really just going to lift the weight to the top of the movement. Does that make sense? Like when one of your kids like dry humps a curl up, like... Mm -hmm. He just used so much power out of the bottom that the inertia turned on. So we turn on a lot in the beginning and then everything was off. But if you go a slow contraction, you're not going to turn on as many motor units, but those that you turn on are going to stay on for the entire movement. Okay. So now proprioceptors are what we talked about a little bit before with the muscle spindles and the Golgi tendon organs. Now we're going to go a little bit deeper here. And so this is literally telling our body what's going on with our body position which in turn is going to, you know, hopefully get us to be in the right position for different movements. 
So the muscle spindle is going to be a sensory neuron inside of your muscles that whenever it feels a stretch or detects a stretch in the muscle, it's gonna tell the muscle to relax, or sorry, tell the muscle to contract. The reason it's telling the muscle to contract is if you keep stretching that muscle, you will tear the muscle. So it looks like so. So it, the muscle spindle sends the signal <clears throat> through your spinal column. It doesn't actually go all the way up to your brain. From there, it's going to activate the motor neuron and tell the muscle to contract to protect the muscle. And this is why, you know, if you're stretching your hamstring, stretching your groin really aggressively and you feel that muscle, you feel the tension in it. So then the receptor in the tendon is the Golgi tendon organ. And when it feels a stretch upon the tendon, it's going to tell the muscle to relax. So, whereas it's gonna feel a stretch in the tendon, once again, goes and sends an inhibitory signal to the motor neuron so the muscle's not gonna to contract too hard and cause, sorry, to contract. And you've, you've seen it with like your kids, like when they squat a heavier weight than they should, and once again, like their legs just give out, or somebody's trying to bench press more than their body's ready for and their arms just give out on them. It's literally, it's a spinal reflex. It's not a, co it's not a conscious decision. Instead, it's essentially being short-circuited. Okay. So, yay. So now it's just kind of bringing it home. If we do a better job of contracting our muscles, so literally learning how to you know, use what we do have, we're gonna become a stronger athlete. If we get bigger muscles, we're going to get better. And then if we're talking about compound movements, which we typically always are, if we're doing a better job of tapping into those fast switch fibers at a higher rate initially, we're going to be able to accelerate faster, which means we're gonna be more explosive, so in theory, you're probably going to do better at that given sport. Make sense? Yeah. I think we can both agree that I don't need to tell you much about the cardiovascular system. <laughs> kind of think that's your jam. That, that is probably what I know the most about, yes. The, the only thing I would say is maybe go through and look at your valves. Yeah. Again, so yeah. the nice thing is, is the, okay, tricuspid valve, that is your, the different, that's going from your right atria to your right ventricle, but then right. the pulmonary valve, because it goes to your pulmonary artery, aka the artery going around your lungs, come back through your pulmonary veins into your left atrium, then that goes to the mitral valve also sometimes referred to as the bicuspid valve, but they're gonna to refer to it as the mitral valve here. And then you have your aortic valve, which goes to your aorta. So, I mean, the pulmonary valve and the aortic valve, I feel like are easy to remember. Tricuspid on your right, mitral on your left. Okay, those are the ones that I would <clears throat> think that you might wanna pay a little attention to, but I feel like they're I mean, honestly, it's kind of flip through and remember what's going on. I may have to pause here. What time is it? 925. Yeah, I got to go meet my contractor to, to give him the stuff he's got to fix before I pay him his final bill. Hey, no, man, you do you. Let me, I'm going to go ahead and.